see everybody out this Sunday evening. We uh, we know and realize a lot of people are sick. I can I can still hear coughing in the audience, and some of you are still trying to get over what you had three weeks ago. So my heart goes out to you, and we definitely got you in our prayers, especially those who are not here because of sickness. Last week we started a series on trusting God, and I asked the question, how do you know you're trusting God? We have, we have people to tell us all the time, trust God, and we say, okay, but how do you know you are trusting God? Are there practical ways that we demonstrate that we are trusting God in our lives? And last week I looked at a first step to know that you're trusting God. And the first step in knowing that you're trusting God was whenever something happens, stop looking at things from a human perspective and formulating conclusions on how you think everything is going to turn out. And we looked at some biblical examples of that. One of them was the life of Joseph. If Joseph had to interpret the moment him and his brothers got into it, if he had interpreted that from a human perspective, he never, ever would have saw what God had for him down the road. So we cannot interpret life situations based upon human ideas and the limit to our thinking. Okay? And we looked at uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, which talks about us not leaning on our own understanding but acknowledging God in all our ways and letting him guide our footsteps, our pathways. Step number two in knowing that you are fully trusting God is this. You must be allowing God to distract you from the situation. If you are not allowing God to distract you from the situation, you are not demonstrating trust in God. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that in just a minute. But before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit about distractions. Because distractions are very important and they can be very useful. There are healthy distractions and unhealthy distractions. I'm going to read some general information from you. Just bear with me just a minute. I need to set the stage for what I'm trying, for the point that I'm trying to make. But when we take our kids to the doctors to get a shot, there's a lot of distracting going on, isn't it? While that needle is while that needle is going into that that toddler's uh, uh, leg, how many of your parents just sit there and say, "Watch that! You're not doing that. You got all kinds of stuff out. You got a gun out. You got a uh, grenade. You got a baby dog. You got a Tonka truck. Whatever you can pull out that a baby is interested in, that's what you got out. And why are you doing that? Because you're trying to distract that child from the pain at hand." Hospitals are doing this now with cancer patients. I found this from the University of Rochester Medical Center. They said distractions have been found to be effective when patients are experiencing anxiety, nausea, and pain. It does not cure cancer, but it has been shown that distracting patients' minds from unpleasant thoughts and procedures or pain can help them feel better about what they're going through. And they use a lot of different things to do that, such as art, music, dance, and different stuff like that. All, the, the whole purpose of that is them trying to distract their patients away from the pain at hand and making them feel better about their current situation. The last thing I want to read is something that was written by a guy named Blaise Pascal. Uh, he was a 17th century writer. He was a mathematician. He was writing about uh, distraction, and I think what he wrote about distraction kind of sums up a lot of what we do when we get ourselves in a situation. Because normally what we do when, when we get ourselves in a situation, we do sometimes tend to try to find distractions. But the distractions that we try to find are not related to God. We go out and we do things, and that's okay. We go to the movies, we get involved with, with, the, with the exercise program, or some people turn to drinking, some people turn to alcohol. But we're, we're trying to take our mind off of what we're going through. He wrote this right here. The only good thing for men is to be diverted from thinking of what they are, either by some occupation which takes their mind off of it, or by some novel or agreeable passion which keeps them busy, like gambling, hunting, and some absorbing show. In short, it is called diversion. That's why gaming and feminist society, war, and high places are so popular. It's not that they really bring happiness, what people want is not an easy and peaceful life that allows them to think about their condition. 
but the agitation that takes the mind off and diverts us. That is why this man who lost his only son a few months ago and so troubled and oppressed this morning by the lawsuits and quarrels, he's not thinking about it anymore. Why, he, why is he not thinking about it? Because at the moment, he's congregating all his attention on where the wild boar is going and whether or not his dogs have located it, who have been pursuing it for the last six hours. That's all he needs. However sad a man may be, if, he can if, if, if you can persuade him to take up some diversion, he will be happy while it lasts. Without diversion, there's no joy. Without diver with diversion, there is no sadness. Now, I do think there is a bit of truth in that. And the truth in that is this right here. Diversion and distraction from what we are going through is beneficial to you. <coughs> what I don't agree with is this right here. That we should be solely distracted by the things of the world. That is the key. And so my heading is this right here. To demonstrate whether or not you are truly trusting God, you must show that you are allowing God to distract you and not the things of the world. Now, what are some ways that we allow God to distract us and demonstrate our trust in him? Okay? Way number one is this right here. We pray. This, this here has become a cliche too. But I'm telling you, there is something about praying and the human psyche, how God has built us and designed us, that prayer takes our mind off of what we're going through, at least for a moment. It distracts us from the problem, and it places our focus on the one who can help us with the problem, and that is God. You remember the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18 of this woman who was trying to get vengeance against her adversary and she kept pursuing this judge and kept pursuing this judge and Jesus used that story as an example of how our life in prayer should be persistent. He said, don't ever stop praying. Don't ever lose heart. Keep praying, Luke 18 to verse number 1. So Jesus understood that prayer is vital in life. What happened to him in Luke chapter 22? When he felt stressed, when he felt anxiety, when he felt like he could not go any further, what did he do? He withdrew himself from his disciples and he went in the garden of Gethsemane and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. The moment he was praying, the time that he was down on his knees talking to his heavenly father, his mind was distracted away from the things of life and his attention was totally turned toward God. Prayer is important. Prayer is a healthy distraction when you're facing difficulties in life. And I'm not just talking about the prayer that's going down the road in your car. I'm not just talking about the prayer at the kitchen table to bless your food. I'm talking about you finding time to remove yourself away from everything and everybody. Go in a closet, go in a room, shut your door and cut off the light and put your head down and talk to your father. Turn your Bibles over to 2 Samuel chapter, 20, 2 Samuel chapter 22 and let's look at an example of what we mean by praying and allowing prayer to be a sign that we are truly trusted in God. 2 Samuel chapter 22, beginning with verse number 1. Then David spoke the words, uh, then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song. On the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hands of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer the God of my strength, in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you saved me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death surround me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid, the sorrows of Sheol surrounded me, the snares of death confronted me, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. And he heard my voice from his temple. And my cry entered his ears. David said the first thing he did in times of trouble was pray. Was pray. Because prayer 
is a healthy <laughs> distraction from the things that you're going through, and it shows that you are demonstrating your trust in God by the simple fact that you are turning to him to ask for help. And if you don't believe prayer is a place where you can go for help, in your spare time, read Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15 and follow. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about Jesus, and it talks about him asking us to come to the throne of grace for help in the time of need. Let me read it very quickly. You don't have to turn over there. But in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15, it says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but he was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace so that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Now, when you are faced with a tragedy in life, when you are faced with a difficult situation, how many of you stop what you're doing, fall down on your knees, and give time to God in prayer? I know what you're saying. You say it doesn't work. And you know why you're saying that? Because you hadn't seen any changes. You have not seen any changes, but there have been changes. You just missed them. And you know why you missed them? Because you have been looking for a certain type of change. You see, God has already been changing the situation to benefit you in the way that he knows is going to benefit you. But it's not being changed in the way that you want it. And because you cannot recognize the change, you have assumed God did not hear your prayer. You are wrong. You're wrong. God doesn't turn a deaf ear to his children. But God provides for his children what they need. And not what they want. And that's the key. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says wait. And sometimes God says I'm going to do it my way. Just sit back and be patient. Pray. Number two. Another way to demonstrate that you are truly trusting in God. Is through meditation. And here's what I mean by meditation. Let me explain this because we, we, are, we are a movie field society and we watch too many movies. So when you think about meditation, you think about, you know, somebody sitting down at a wall with all these candles lit and pictures in the background and talk about, mm, and that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about meditation. I'm talking about thinking on God, thinking on spiritual things all the time. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about meditation. I'm talking about when you're laying on your bed, instead of laying there thinking about how bad your situation is, lay there and think about how good God has been to you so far. When you're riding down the road and you're thinking about, you're thinking about how bad and complicated your life is, look back and think about where you could have been. But by the grace and mercy of God, you're not there. You're in a different place to be thankful. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about meditation. I'm talking about thinking about the goodness of God and the works of God in your life. And how he has shown himself in your life in more ways than one by the things that he has blessed you with. Tell your Bible over Psalms chapter 77. Psalm <coughs> 77. Let's look at this verse here that talks about meditating on God. Psalm 77, verse 10 through 12. <coughs> Notice what the psalmist said. And by the way, most of these psalms are the same. They're dealing with something about troubles of life. Look at verse number 2. Uh, let's look at verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 77. I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. Now look at verse 2. In the day of my what? Of my trouble, I sought the Lord. I'm telling you, you cannot read these psalms without understanding all of the pain that's in the lives of some of these writers. And the psalmist says, in my trouble, I cried out to God. Notice verse 10 through 12. And I said... This is my anguish. This is my anguish. Notice that now. This is my infirmity. This is my pain. 
pain. The psalmist could have been sitting down on his front porch. He could have been laying down in his bed. But wherever he was, he looked at his life and he said, this is my pain. This is my infirmity. This is my anguish of life. This is my trouble. This is what I am focused on. But notice what he did. In the same verse, notice. Verse number 10. Let me read it again. And I said, this is my anguish. But I remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. And I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. And I will meditate on your work. And I will talk of your deeds. The psalmist sat around and said, this is my anguish, this is my pain, this is what I'm going through. So he was not far removed from his own life. He wasn't far removed from the struggles that he was facing. But what he did is he wanted to practically demonstrate his trust in God. And in order to do that, he had to distract himself from what he was going through. And to do that, the psalmist says, instead of focusing on my anguish, I focus on how good God has been to me. I focus on how far God has brought me. I focus on the works of God. And not only did I focus on the work of God, in verse number 12, the Bible says he talked about the deeds. Because, see, you, can't, you cannot meditate on God and you cannot meditate on God's word without talking about it to someone. The psalmist went from a state of anguish, pain, to a state of meditation, thinking about the wonders of God's work in his own life. And then being so excited about the wonders of God's work in his life to actually sharing that with somebody. And you know what? The whole time he was sharing God's wonder to some, to some other person, that was the, he, he was not thinking about his own problem. So we demonstrate our trust in God by meditating on God, meditating on God's word and what God has done in your life. Listen here. You may think you're going through something bad right now, but it, I guarantee you it can get worse. I, I guarantee you it can get worse. Your children may be in a tough situation right now, but it can get worse. Your relationships may be in a tough situation, but it can get a whole lot worse. Life can always get worse for the living, y'all. Always. And so we must meditate on the goodness of God. Do you know why? That's, do you know, in my personal opinion, this is why I believe a lot of people mis, misinterpret Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 7. Let's turn over there and look at that verse. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 7. And you all know the verse, but I want us to read it together in the context. And it's the verse that talks about the peace that passes all understanding. I used to read this verse over and over and over and over when I was going through something, and I never had the peace that it's talking about. I couldn't figure out why. Philippians 4, verse number 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind through Christ Jesus. Verse number 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when you do that, supposedly, when you pray, supposedly, when you make supplications to God, this peace is supposed to just come into your heart and guard your heart from any unpeaceful thoughts. That's what I thought this was. Never worked for me. It never worked for me. And you know what I found out? The reason this verse was not working for me is because I was not creating an environment of peace for myself based upon my trust in God. You see, this verse right here, verse number 7 does not work without verse 6. And there is something in verse 6 that ties into the verse that we just read. You remember in Psalm 77, verse 10 through 12, the psalmist says that the way he was able to not focus on his anguish was to think about the goodness of God and think about the things that God has done in his life. And he thought about those things and he talked about those things and it helped him through his problems. That goes along with verse 6. And let me show you. Look at verse 6 again, Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in prayer, but in everything by prayer and supplication. 
Notice, he did not say just pray to God. He did not say just make supplication with God. But he said, let something accompany that prayer. Let something, let something accompany that supplication. And you know what it is? Look at the next word. Thanksgiving. By prayer and th supplication with thanksgiving. You know what that means? When you're praying to God because of a problem that you may be facing in life. And you're making supplications with God. What offsets the pain and you focusing on what you're going through is when you stop then and begin to give God thanks for what you have and thanks for what you have been, uh, been brought from. You see, the thanksgiving is the key to having the peace that passes all understanding. It's when you start expressing your thanksgiving to God that things are not worse than what they are. That's when your attention begins to shift from what you're going through to how bad things really could be. And it changes your whole perspective about life. Oh man, house fire. They lost everything. And they're praying to God that God would give it all back. They lost everything, y'all. Everything. And then the mom turned around and looked at the father and the children and said, but, and, and she began to smile while the house was burning, but, I am so thankful that my family has been spared. Do you see how that bit of thanksgiving for something that means a lot to them has now turned their whole attention from what has been lost to what they currently have? Being thankful for the goodness of God and meditating on that proves that you are truly trusting in God. A third and final thing I'm going to look at for tonight, it's not the final thing on my list, there are other things on my list, but the final one I'm going to look at tonight has to do with the Word of God. We demonstrate our trust in God by, Lord, I'm trusting you. See? Patience, I just kept mashing. Just kept mashing. Studying God's Word. I know this too can be a cliche from me by telling you to study. But you got to think about this. I don't get any benefits. Mark, when he's up here and he's encouraging you all to study, Mark doesn't get any benefit from you all studying. It doesn't add anything to his life other than the joy of knowing Christians are growing. When the elders encourage us to study our Bible, they don't get anything personal from that other than the fact that they see Christians growing. The benefit that we, the benefit that comes from studying, is the benefit that you receive yourself. Okay, when you are going through something and you're facing trouble, that's not the time to say, "Not right now," because see, when you push this to the side, you're not demonstrating your trust in God. You demonstrating your, you demonstrate your trust in God when you're going through a difficult time and you say. This is exactly what I need. Let me open it up and read. And let me show that to you. Turn to Psalms chapter 107, verse 19 and verse number 20. Psalms 107, verse 19 and verse number 20. Let's start at verse 17. It says, Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. So they brought this on themselves. Verse 18. Their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. And then in verse 17, I mean verse 19, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them out of their distress. So let's stop for a minute. Here you have these individuals, these foolish individuals who made bad decisions in life. Whatever they were doing, they brought calamity upon themselves. They brought the, their own stresses in life. They brought it upon themselves. It's much like we do sometimes. In all of our good intentions, sometimes we still make bad decisions and the bad decisions that we make. It brings hardships for ourselves. We do it in our relationships. We do it in our decisions when it comes to our children or our jobs. And it's just the fact 
that we make bad decisions and bad decisions bring hardships in our lives. These people here were the same way. And the Bible says when they found themselves in anguish, they cried out to God in verse number 19, and he saved them. Now, how did he save them is the key. And I think we find that in the next verse. Look at verse 20. And he sent his what? Word and healed. Listen to me very carefully. If you're sitting in the audience today and you as an individual need to be healed, you can find healing through God's word. You don't need many hands and none of these fake healers to bring you healing. If you're sitting in the audience today and your relationship with other people it's crumbling. You can find healing in God's word. If your family is broken, you can find healing in God's word. If the church is broken, we can find healing through God's word. If our lives are broken, we can find healing. God says through the psalmist that he saved these people and sent his word and healed them. When you're going through tough times, you demonstrate your trust in God by not closing this and putting it on the shelf, but by picking this up, reading it, and trusting every word that God has to say. You've got to believe it. I'm reminded when the Apostle Paul was getting ready to leave, he called the elders in Acts chapter 20, verse number 17, to the island of Miletus. And he told them some things that he wanted them to do and look out for after his departure. And Paul told them that he wanted to leave them with something that was going to benefit them. And we find that in Acts chapter 20. I think it's verse number 32. And here's what he said. Uh, Acts 20. Verse 32. Okay. Uh, Yes, Acts 20, verse 32. Notice what Paul told these elders at the church at Ephesus. He says, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. You elders, I, I know times are going to be difficult for you after I'm gone. And I know that there are going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of trouble within the body of Christ when I'm gone. You are going to need strength to endure. And I'm leaving something with you. I'm leaving the God of heaven with you, elders. But not, I'm not only leaving that. I'm leaving the word of his grace with you because it's the very word that you must cling to that's going to give you strength. So, no, we don't just want our elders to encourage us to read the word of God and be built up. We want to encourage them, too, because we know they need the strength. And if the word of God can provide strength for our elders, guess what? It can provide strength for us, too, when we're facing difficult times. But it can do nothing for you if you believe that what you're going through is so difficult that you don't have time to read it. It can't help you. When Peter wrote to the people he wrote to, he told them to be newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk of the word so they can grow. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The church of Corinth had so many problems. They were carnal. carnal. And Paul said, I, I'm trying to feed you, but I can't feed you with meat. meat. You need milk. But you've got to grow. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 uh, uh, through 15, the Hebrew writer talks about them needing to be fed with milk, but they couldn't be because they were still on me uh, meat, but they couldn't be because they were still on milk. He said they needed to grow. Let me tell you something. When you are in a difficult situation that decisions have to be made, that's the moment that you need to grow. That's the moment that you need to think clearly, and you cannot think clearly on your own. Demonstrate your trust in God. Number one, by praying. Number two, by meditating on the goodness of God. And number three, by opening up the word of God so you can receive the necessary strength you need to make it through the things that you're going through. 
If you're here tonight and you probably haven't been doing that, you've probably been distracted, but not by God. You've been distracted by other things. And these other things have been unhealthy distractions for you. Now is the time to be distracted by God. Now is the time to let God help mend the brokenness that may be in your life. Now is the time for you to start praying. Start meditating on the goodness of God and where he's brought you from. And start studying your Bible so you can receive the strength you need to make it. If you're here and you're not a child of God and you want to become one through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, do that. Don't put it off because tomorrow is not promised. People are dying every second. Every second. David says it's only a step between me and death. And truly it is for all of us. If you have a need tonight and we can help you in any way, please come. As together we stand and sing.